So welcome to API Apocalypse. Um, for anybody who's maybe wondering what this is about, what I'm going to do is I'm very briefly going to go into APIs. Obviously, even 50 minutes is a really short amount of time to try to really fully grasp them. But I'm going to do my best to help you guys get at least that basic understanding of it. And then once we get there, I am then going to start interacting with an API that I have set up that is vulnerable. And as a pen tester, I'm going to walk you through the things that I look for. And hopefully, if we're lucky, we'll be able to hack something today. Maybe. So uh, a little bit of background about me. First of all, you might have noticed my hair is drastically shorter. I just cut it all off within like the past month. So it, do not be, that is me, I promise. Uh, <laughs> so I'm a senior security consultant at Secure Ideas. I've been there for about three years now. Uh, but my background, I started as a SOC analyst, but pretty quickly I ended up moving into a position where I was reverse engineering malware. And I was also doing pen testing for APIs and web applications at the time. And eventually I kind of decided that I wanted to go someplace else and do half of my job for the same amount of money. So that's how I ended up at Security Is. I just do pen testing now. Um, but we also do security consulting and training. I am the lead, uh, primary author and lead instructor for our API pen testing class. So if you're ever wanting to learn how to pen test APIs, uh, definitely reach out to me. I'm always happy to answer questions and send you some more resources. Some other fun facts about me, uh, all around geek. Originally, whenever I wrote this talk, it was all Fallout themed, uh, but I was worried that maybe that was too niche. So obviously I named it after this really old movie. Um, that's really not that old. Uh, and, then it, and then they came out with the Fallout TV show, and now I realize that it totally would have been perfect just to keep it with Fallout, but no, no, here we are now. Uh, I'm a collector of things. Anybody who's ever seen me on a webcast or been in a meeting with me, you know that I have a ton of uh, anime figures and video game collection. Uh, my entire dining room is Fallout themed. Uh, I am a lockpick enthusiast. I am the leader for the Jacksonville chapter of Tool, and finally, I might be a crazy cat lady. Uh, and I say that because when I first started at Secure Ideas, I, <clears throat> Kevin told me that the number to become a crazy cat lady was three. And he said this as somebody who had like 8,000 cats at the time. He had eight cats. Uh, at the time I had two, but shortly after that, I acquired a third cat as, you know, life just hands you cats. Um, so now I have three cats, so maybe I'm a crazy cat lady. Um, you might be wondering what is an API? First of all, I was pen testing APIs for probably five years before I could reliably remember what API stood for. And I don't know why. Acronym, this field loves acronyms, but it's the application programming interface. It is essentially, it is a collection of functions that are exposed by a web service. And these are really designed for computer to com computer communication. This is a very basic API request. The way that I've always thought to describe APIs is as if you were uh, at a restaurant, like the waiter. At home, I have everything I need to cook spaghetti. I have pasta, I have pasta sauce, I have the pot, I have a stove, believe it or not. And if I want a brick oven pizza, I don't have, I don't have a brick oven. Um, I could probably make the dough, I don't know, that's variable. Uh, so if I want a brick oven pizza, I'm gonna have to go up the road to a pizzeria but they don't want to just let me walk into their kitchen and start using their oven and their utensils and all of their ingredients because they don't know who I am. They don't know if I'm like certified to handle food. What if I contaminate everything? So instead, I'll go in, I'll sit down, I will tell the waiter what I want, he will take that order to the kitchen, the kitchen will prepare it, and then the waiter will bring it back to me. So in essence, that is what an API does. Facebook needs to give you access to some of their functionality that's internal to them or some of their internal resources, but they don't want to give you direct access. So they'll use APIs to facilitate that computer to computer communication. So this is a very basic API call. These can get quite a bit more complex than this, but we have the user, the com the, we're on a website, and it'll do the request to the API. It'll use the API URL um, and say, hey, let's get all of the account information for user one, two, three. And the API says, okay, let's go get that information from the backend server. And then the backend server will hand it back to the API and the API will return that information to me as the user. Um, I wanna say uh, the last time I checked, APIs made up about 82% of current internet traffic. So when I first started pen testing somewhere between eight to 10 years ago, um, 
I encountered maybe one to two API pen tests a year. It really wasn't a ton. They were, they were, but since then they have, uh, well, exploded. I, uh, on average, pen test maybe two to three APIs a month now. Uh, and that's honestly, we could be testing way more than that because they have become so ingrained in our internet and digital infrastructure now. So there's a lot of different reasons why companies might want to integrate APIs. They enable those third-party integrations. If you've ever been on a, a website that has a shopping uh, feature in it, if you add everything to your cart and you go to checkout, you might notice that it'll redirect you through like PayPal or the traffic's actually going through there. That would be an example of where we might use an API. So then the company that's actually hosting the store, they don't really have to worry about handling all the payment processing. They can offload that burden someplace else that's much better established for it. It's also used to facilitate mobile app uh, backends. It used to be uh, whenever we would pen test mobile apps very frequently, it was just going to load the web page in the mobile app. But now, very frequently, what mobile apps are are just an interface for APIs. A lot of mobile app pen tests now focus very heavily on the API component. Uh, and finally, there's the power of the clouds and slash uh, solutions. In short, they are the backbone to our current digital infrastructure. I also want to share with you the OWASP API top 10. So I'm pretty sure most of you should be familiar with the OWASP web application top 10. They also have an API top 10. And I'm actually a huge fan of their API top 10 because as somebody who pen tests a lot of APIs, these are actually really relevant. Uh, but one thing you might notice about these is that the majority of the top 10 issues found with APIs in some way relate to authentication or authorization. This is very true. Um, I will also say whenever it comes to pen testing APIs, they tend to be very go big or go home. Either maybe we might have a few small things here and there, but that's, that's really gonna be it. However, if I'm starting to find like these authorization issues, there's a huge chance that I'm gonna find a lot more than just that one, uh, which is really great. <laughs> I would also like to point out that the server-side request forgery, I actually think it belongs here. If it deserves to be on the web app top 10, that is debatable, but the nature of APIs where it is set up to facilitate communication with those internal servers makes it a prime area to try and achieve a server-side request forgery. So now we get to the fun part. And by fun part, I mean, well, hello. The fun part was the end of it. And we're done. <laughs> okay, there we go. So real quick, uh, I'm using a VM right now. This is called Samurai WTF, and please sign me in. There we go. This is an open source project that SecureIDs has. It's part of the OWASP uh, open source projects. It is a VM. WTF stands for Web Testing Framework. And whenever, by the way, for anybody who's asking, uh, it was named WTF, and then they made it fit with web testing frameworks. So <laughs> um, it's AVM. It comes in a couple of different formats. We have OVA. It'll work with VirtualBox, VMware, Hypervisor. The great thing about it, though, is that it facil facilitates very easy downloading and configuration of vulnerable environments. It's uses a uh, package manager called Katana, and with that you can very easily install an already configured version of uh, DVWA. It has the Dojo Basic, which is another set of really janky web applications, uh, for lack of better words. Jank is a technical term, by the way. So it also is set up so that you can very easily install a bunch of different tools, such as Burp or Postman. Uh, I think it also has uh, like Truffle Hog and SQL Map. I'm also, before we really dive into this, I'm gonna give one caveat. I will be using Postman today. I love Postman, kind of. They have betrayed me, however. I can't use Postman whenever I'm testing anymore because they've moved to a new business model where you kind of have to have the cloud component in order to use it offline. I can't store client data in a place that I don't directly control. So I don't use Postman. Uh, in my day-to-day -day life anymore, but it is still a very powerful tool, especially if you're looking at developing your own APIs or testing your own APIs. 
completely great. It works with just about every API you could throw at it. It's super easy to use once you get the hang of it. Love it. I just wish I could still use it uh, for testing. So first up, the first thing I'm gonna do, because it seems to have closed everything. Yes, it closed everything, cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and open Postman real quick. And we're gonna see if everything's still there. And if it's not, that's fine, because we can work with it. Oh boy. They are, aren't they? So I'm pretty sure I know what the issue is here, because remember whenever I said that you have to be, um, you have to have like the cloud component. Mm -hmm. So real quick, I'm just going to, <laughs> who would have guessed? <laughs> you know what the best part is, is uh, like whenever I was setting up before, this, was, this part was just fine. So real quick, I'm just gonna make sure that I'm on the internet. That was me. Why am I getting a phone call? <laughs> so real quick. Nobody judge my uh, hotspot name. <laughs> okay. So help me if you do not work. After I just went on about how much I loved Postman, even though I can't use it anymore. Hallelujah. Okay, cool. Can't believe it did that to me. So I have Postman up, and already you can see that I've imported uh, into this workspace the collection of the API that we're using. And this is something called vAPI. It is another uh, project that you can easily install on Samurai WTF. This, uh, I will say, it is a little bit of an outdated version. It works off the uh, 2017 OWASP top 10 for APIs, but it is still very much addresses most of the current top 10. I will also say that it has a DVGA, which is the Dam Vulnerable GraphQL application. So if you are interested in pen testing GraphQL at all, that is also in here. Hello, mouse. And up next. Everything just froze on me. Okay. Okay, now we're working again. Everybody sacrifice a potato so that way we keep going. Burp Suite, let's go. Is everybody familiar with Burp Suite? Just out of curiosity. Cool, so I'm gonna go over that real quick. Uh, I am using what is known as the community edition of Burp Suite. This is a free version of it. Now normally, whenever I'm at work, I use the professional version, but you don't have to do that whenever I'm doing any type of demo. I like to use the free version, just because uh, that is the most easily accessible version. The big thing though is that you can't save items with the free version, but if we're just trying to learn how to interact with APIs or pen test applications, Free version is just fine. So whenever we first uh, open Burp, there's a couple of things that we might notice. Uh, we have the target tab. This isn't gonna populate just yet. The really important part is the proxy tab. I'm gonna go make sure that my settings are configured. I have a proxy listener on, on 127.001 on port 8080. That's good, and I can see that it's up and running. So all of my traffic's going to proxy through this, so that way Burp's going to be able to see it. Whenever I make a request in my browser, my browser will hand it to Burp, and then Burp will be able to decide what to do with it next, and it will do whatever I tell it to do. But I wanna make sure that that is set up, and then I'm gonna come back over to Postman real quick, and I'm gonna make sure it's configured to work with Burp. So I'm gonna go to Settings, 
and I'm going to come down here to proxy, and I want to make sure that whatever's here will match what's in burp. So I have 127.001 on port 8080, and another tip is under, is it certificates? No, we want to go to general. <clears throat> you want to make sure the SSL certificate verification is off because BURP will be doing a man in the middle on your own traffic. It will break TLS and everything will freak out. So we want to make sure that Postman isn't trying to check for that. And I can, real quick, I can go to just API 1 and it's kind of already set up a little bit for me to try and connect, but I just want to make sure that I'll be able to connect to this API. So it's going to send a request and, okay, so I got a duplicate entry and I can tell you why I got that. It's because I've already made that account. But now that I've done that and made sure that it will communicate with it, if I come back over to Burp, I can see already that it's kind of filling out this target. <laughs> and so I can see here that there's this API that I can start interacting with. My favorite thing about Burp other than I managed to make my proxy detached, uh, is that we have something called the repeater. Now the repeater is the tool that I use the most. It lets me repeat things over and over and over again. So if I come here to my HTTP history, I can see that's the request that I just made. We made a post request to vapi1, uh, and originally it was creating a user, but if I, send, if I right click in here and send this to repeater, I can see it right there. And I just want to know, can everybody see that okay? Because I made the text bigger earlier, but now it's small again. So let me see if I can make that. Oh, it's somewhere in here. Now the display is, that will make the overall text bigger, but if you want to make the text inside of the request bigger, it's a weird, it's not in the place where you would expect it to be. It is, it is a bit weird, so here it is. It's under inspector and message editor. You go right here, then you can change it here, and then it will make everything bigger in the actual request. So that should be a little bit easier to see. So this is just the basic API request to create a user. We can see up here it's a post request. It's sending data uh, to vapi, api1 slash user. This is to create a new user. So if I wanted to, I can make a new user here. So I'm going to give it RVA sec with RVA sec API. And let's give it the password RVA sec because we're really secure here, obviously. So we've created a new user. We got this 201 created, right? So if I come back over here into Postman to look a little bit more at this API that we're interacting with, I know that API 1 has a few different interactions. I can create a user, I can get a user, and I can update a user. So let's make sure that is. Whenever I created that user, if we come look at this response real quick, we can see that there's an ID here. This ID was assigned to me whenever I created this. So. I know that this API request right here, it has an area for me to fill in the app ID, so I'm willing to bet that if I add it to API 20, or if I add 20 right there, that I should hopefully be able to get my own information back, but let's find out. So if I send this, there we go, success. Um, ID 20, it has the username, the course, and the name. Now, I will say uh, one issue already with this, and I've set this up beforehand, there's a script in place that should make this work, is the authorization token right here. Uh, does anybody recognize what that is? That's just base 64. This is basic auth. Might look like a randomized string of characters, but Burp has this nice little tool called Decoder. So I'm just gonna go throw this in there and decode as base64, and we can see it's just the username and password in clear text. This is If this was intercepted, it would be negligible to figure out what the username and password is for this. So, 
anytime I see a URL like this where, okay, I have this authorization token and I can get my own user data, it's 20, I'm gonna start asking what happens if I change this number. So let's try 19. Well, I got a one, that was interesting. Let's go ahead and grab this back over and burp real quick. So that way we can send that to repeater and start poking at it a little bit more. And we can see right here that Postman's already kind of filled in a lot of that information for me. If I send it here, okay, cool, 19. Let's try 10. Okay, well we have test. What about five? Well, that's me from whenever I was first setting this up. Might notice that since whenever I was first setting it up that there was uh, five, that there was maybe some other things in here before that, such as Jim Halpert. Let's go to two, maybe? Well, we got Meredith. Okay, well, what do you guys think number one's gonna be? Well, close enough, it's Michael Scott. <laughs> so this is something called broken uh, object level authorization. Remember when I said earlier that most of the issues are authentication or authorization focused? Authentication is the process of supplying that username and password or the credentials to prove who you are. That RVA sec, RVA sec, that was me authenticating. So it using basic authentication, that's an authentication vulnerability, however, Authorization is the proof to, sh uh, the, it is the permission to check things that you should be able to check. Uh, an example that I always like to give is I have my driver's license. No problem if I wanna go to a bar and I show them my driver's license, I can get in there, no problem. If I want to get onto a military base though, that driver's license is not gonna cut it. It is not the right. I don't have the right authority or the authorization to get on with just my driver's license. I need some form of ID that actually permits me to go there. So it is the ability to access what you should be allowed to access. And in this case, even though um, I was able to access user 20, that was my user, I just made it, right? Should I really be able to access Michael Scott's information? So, there was no authorization checks here to see if I should or should not be allowed to do that. So up next, let's see what else do we have here. We have a couple of other APIs, uh, other functionalities within this API. So API 2, and we're probably not okay. So API 2 is a brute force one, and the brute forcing for um, the free version of Burp can take a little bit because they rate limit you. So we're not gonna do any of the brute forcing or the fuzzing ones, just because that might take a while. So API 4 is also going to be another one. Uh, by the way, API 4, you can brute force the OTP. You might think, well that's not realistic, except for I on average brute force maybe two to three MFA systems a year successfully. Don't know why I'm able to do that, but I am. So let's look at number five. Okay, so this one says right now that this is a broken function level authorization and I've got two options here. I can create a user and I can get a user. So let's go ahead and build this out. So I don't have any of the authentication uh, stuff set up for this one yet because I haven't really created a user for this yet. But I'm gonna come over here to body and postman and I'm gonna look at this and see what kind of input is it expecting. So it looks like it's expecting this. So. Let me go ahead real quick, and we're just gonna make another user just for you guys. Can I spell? No, I cannot. By the way, I'm using the laptop mount or keyboard. I almost never use this. Please, please be nice. Okay, did I create a user? Well, I have ID3. Now, I wanna know already uh, will this get user? I can see that it's also asking for the ID, just like API 1 was. But let's try it first. So already I need to make sure that the authorization 
token is correct, it is not filled in. There should be a script here, it doesn't always fill it in. So let me just go grab this because guess what? It's basic auth, I already have it, it's right here. And now on any pen test, I would actually probably make sure that that was carried over in some way so that way I didn't have to go do this a whole bunch. But what is life if not struggling in front of other people? Such as my mouse not scrolling down. Here we go. And I just got the ID three, right? So let's see. Okay, I got my information back. Well, do you think that maybe the same thing will work again? Okay, well, my username and password's not right. I might try a couple more. Hmm. Maybe if I just go this way? Well, I got an empty response. But let's try users. Oh, okay. So it looks like it just spit out all of the users of the system to me. So while previously it was checking to see if I, it wasn't, i sorry, let me correct that. It was not checking to see if I had access to look at other users. This one's not checking to see if I have access to look at the base users um, storage. It's very fun. So anytime we see any type of URL, like I said, anytime we see any URLs where it's really interesting, what happens if I start changing the parameters just a little bit? Well, is there a users, is one of the number uh, APIs of users API? Yeah, so API 5, uh, whenever you first set this up, it was something like this originally. So let's say that if I'm on a website and I want to go look at my own account, it would probably do an API request to uh, V API API 5 user 3. Whenever I would see that either in my burp history or in the browser, I would then start interacting with that directly. Uh, I can test APIs without ever having to touch the web app. There's, there's a web app to this, by the way. We don't even have to go there. And so that's when I start kind of poking around at it. Anytime I see like maybe account, what if I do accounts? It's a lot of pen testing is saying, what happens if I do this? And then doing it. More often than not, it is successful. Let's look at number six. Ooh, mass assignment's good. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, mass assignment is basically, it, it will accept my input without question. So a good example of that is, let's say that I wanna delete somebody else's blog post. It's not gonna check to see if I have the permission to do that, it's just gonna let me do it. So in this one, let's go create a user real quick. So, let's see, it's already got that set up. Let's go ahead and set up our body real quick. And so for this, oh, my watch just died. So I'm trying to keep track on time, sorry about that. So let's just keep going with the RVA, RVA sec theme. If only I could spell. So. Here we go. We've created an account. I've got the ID 11. Cool. Now, it looks like, if I'm willing to bet, it's going to tie the information specifically to my authentication token because it says me, right? So let me go grab this again. That's the joy. By the way, I highly discourage using the same username and password everywhere like I am right now. So, let's see here. Let's get my information. So that, that gets me information back. And there's a couple of different ways that I might try messing around with this. I could probably try users. Probably not going to succeed. No. But let's go back to me. And there is something interesting about this one. I noticed that this one has credit. So, what happens? If I create a new user, and then part of that creation process, I tell it how many credits I have, do you think it'll accept it? Let's go find out. So I'm just gonna add in here, hey, guess what, that is not credits.
apparently it did not accept my control C. Oh, we're just ever slightly misaligned now. Of course. Okay. So how many credits should I try to give myself? <laughs> Eleven. Oh, you're right. I do need a comma there. Good catch. <laughs> well, good catch to everybody who caught the comma. Okay, so I have created a new account, which, by the way, I'm a little bit concerned. I just realized I didn't update the name, username, or password. So already that's another issue in that I was just able to create the same account on top of the other one, but that's neither here nor there. Let's try this again. Well, yeah, the ID is 12. So you know what we might have to do? We might have to change the name because, of course. Okay, so now we're 13. Let me go grab a new token real quick. Encode is base 64. If only computer mount or keyboards worked. So real quick, let's go ahead, new header. Okay, have I just lost? Oh, you know what? I'm in the wrong spot. I need to be a git user, not dragging it away. There we go. I have now created a new user. I have given myself exactly 11 credits. Although let's be honest, if we were able to assign ourselves credit for something, we would probably give ourselves a little bit more than 11. So in this case, what happened is I found out that there was going to be another parameter there eventually that was going to be assigned to my account. And probably this application was intended that it would, once you created an account, you could go purchase credits, whatever. I was just able to go ahead and add, well, you know what, let's put, 13 or 11 credits here and the application said, okay, let's do it. It just blindly accepted my input. Generally not a great idea. So, let's go, I believe eight's where we wanna go next because, I mean, let's be honest. Injection's where it's at, right? So I can see here, uh, if we go look at this one, there's two options. We have a user login and then get secret. And likely this get secret, let's look at the auth that it's probably expecting, probably going to be an authorization token. I might be base64, but I don't actually know what the username and password is. So I'm gonna start poking at this. And I got an error already. And one thing I love about SQL in general is that it gives you very detailed error messages. So much so that this one told me it was MySQL. So to make this part a little bit easier, what I'm actually going to do is I'm gonna come back over to Burp, and this is the login that generated the error. I'm gonna send it to Repeater. By the way, for those of you who don't know, mind you, uh, this is uh, probably one of the best things I ever learned. You can rename the Repeater tabs. So I'm just gonna name this one to in, oop, Injection. Uh, it, it lets you pretty easily kind of keep track of it. Now, I already kind of have an idea of how this is going to work out just because whenever I was reverse engineering malware, I had to maintain a, a database for not only uh, indicators of compromise, but also samples, and I actually used MySQL. So, let's try the or one equals one. Whoop, I need a single quote on that side. Let's try this. Ah, there we go. That was easy. Um, does anybody know why one equals one works? It's always, true. it's always true, yes. And if one side is true, then all sides have to be true. So we now have the authorization key for the admin account. And well, I'm gonna assume it's the admin account. And the reason why I'm assuming the, it's the admin account is very frequently, this is just gonna sign you in as the first person in the database. 
And also very frequently, the first person in the database is either going to be a test account or an admin account. So let's go back over here to our collection. Let's see, I can get user. So let's see if we can get a little bit more information. Oh, you're right, I'm on six, good catch. So we can get secret. And it's going to need that authorization token that I just had. There we go. So it looks like I was indeed an admin. And you know, just for shiggles, uh, I don't think this one's base 64, but let's go find out. Ooh, no. So yeah, that wouldn't have been one that would have been very easy for us to guess to begin with. So I think we should have just about enough time for maybe one more. Hopefully, maybe, let's find out. I have been more successful at these than I thought I was going to be so far because um, while I have experience doing all of these and I've done all of this in the wild many times, I do like to try and showcase some of my failures as well as my successes. So while I have practiced these, there are many times where I get up here and I'm like, I don't remember what I was supposed to do here, so let's play around. Okay, well, we need to move on now. So I have made it a lot further than I was expecting. So API 9, I can see right here that says V2. One of the really interesting things about this, if I see V2 in an API, I always want to check to see for V1 because this is a version number. And there's nothing inherently wrong with having V1, V2, V3 because we have to have different versions and it's important to indicate that in some way. But if we are getting rid of V1, we should make sure V1's not accessible for any reason at least to an external attacker. Because very frequently, those updated versions fix some sort of security flaw. So let's go ahead and start. Uh, we only have one option here and it's to log in. This one's already filled out for us. I don't have to worry about it so much. So I'm just gonna send it and let's go grab this and burp. So here we go. And something that I've already noticed right here, there's a rate limit of five and I have four remaining. So it would be really hard to brute force this. At this point, I'm getting an internal server error. But what do you guys think will happen if I change this to one? Yeah, so it looks like I would be able to easily brute force this. Now, usually if I'm going to brute force something or prove that something's brute forceable or anything like that, I would probably set up about 300 false, like known bad passwords, and then on the like 301st attempt, sign in with my actual credentials. This is very easy to do either through scripting or burp intruder. And the reason why I do that is very frequently just proving that I can do it is enough to prove that there is an issue there. Now, there are times that clients will be like, no, we want you to brute force things but I'm always a little bit wary of that because I don't want to lock people out of their accounts. I did that once at a university. I locked every teacher out of their account at 2 a.m. because I hit enter too soon. I meant to limit my attempts to five because I knew their lockouts were 10 and I did not limit them at all and it was bad. Uh, so I try to avoid that. But in this case, if there is this older version of it that had these security flaws, probably should have gone and uh, fixed that, or at least made it so that it wasn't publicly accessible. I know that uh, API pen testing isn't nearly as uh, pretty as maybe web app pen testing, because, I mean, let's be honest, you guys looked at a bunch of text for 50 minutes. And remember when I said there's actually is a, a web inter, if only I could remember where I was. So we have a browser, right? Burp has a built-in browser and we were interacting with vAPI test. We can go to it, but I did all of those things without ever actually seeing it in the browser. And believe it or not, um, anytime I find a web app that has any type of v API in it, I get, I get so happy. Not too long ago, there was a test that we were doing internally and I came into the test part way through and the time between me first loading the application in my browser and the time that I got full administrative control over the application was five minutes. Uh, I went and checked the, the timestamps because I was just 
blown away that I was able to do that so fast. Uh, I will never reach that height again. Um, so what ended up happening was I always go through and I start looking at JavaScript and trying to find any places where it might be building out these API calls. You would be surprised at how much information is given away in scripts. And I noticed that it was setting up this blank authentication for the user and non. Okay, well, let me try recreating this request that it built here. Okay, well, it gave me a, an uh, authentication token. Let me go see what I can do with that. And now, really, what happened is it told me the permissions for that account where I could look at things. Uh, but there was one exception. I was read on almost every single part of this application with the Anon user, except for it let me create a user for some reason. But another really interesting thing is they weren't checking. That, remember that mass assignment earlier where I just told it how many credits I had? There was absolutely nothing to stop me from adding is admin true to the create user request. So I did that. And then I signed in with my brand new administrator account. Oh boy. Um, some other kind of common issues, by the way, with APIs. I very frequently see API keys leaked in those scripts. Sometimes they're like Rotten Tomatoes or Google Analytics or Google Maps API keys. It's not a problem if those are there. Probably don't want your internal uh, access to the API keys that should be uh, protected in that. Uh, I also see those in the URL a lot for some reason. We should probably treat sensitive API keys the same as we treat usernames and passwords. Let's not send them in the URL, please. Please, I'm begging you. Uh, or keep doing it and then hire me to pen test you because that would be really fun. So I know we're coming up pretty close to the end of this. I know I've lost, my watch died in the middle of this, by the way. Cool. So now is the prime time for questions. Hello. Behold the cats. <laughs> so yeah, I, I do have, uh, by the way, Pluto is short for, for plutonium. <laughs> yeah, what's up? So it's actually a pretty big issue. Um, and like I said earlier, most of it comes back to the authorization or authentication issues. We did have a pen test recently where, let's say that there was a student level account, a teacher level, level account, and then the principal, right? Uh, they had really strict authorization checks in place to make sure that the, the teachers couldn't access the principal functionality, but nobody thought to make sure that the students didn't. So we could not only view and access all the principal functionality as a student, we could access other, other tenants for other schools and start updating grades. Whoa. By the way, I don't know why we never thought to, why they didn't, because in my head, I would assume, oh no, if somebody was going to try and mess with the principal's accounts, it's definitely going to be the students. I would not automatically assume the teachers. I would assume the students. Um, so yeah, it is a really big problem. But in many cases, if you at least attempt to set up an API somewhat securely and follow some sort of um, one testing along the way, any time for uh, quality assurance or quality checks during the development process, that's a chance to implement some form of security checks. Usually, if companies do that, API pen tests are really boring for me. I actually really hate API pen tests because they tend to be very boring. Um, one, I'm staring at this wall of text for days on end, and two, as long as they really, as long as they made an effort to try and secure it, usually there's not a whole lot there for me to find. But the companies that just willy nilly like threw the APIs out there, they're like, yeah, we have an API now. We're so cool. We're with the times. You can tell. Um, not not good. Yes. Yes. So GraphQL, um, and for those of you who are wondering, GraphQL is an API that was created by Facebook. 
to handle their own. Um, they were trying to fix a lot of the issues that exist within REST API. So the API we were interacting with today is a REST API, which is very vulnerable very frequently to that excessive data sh uh, exposure. It, I was able to access things I shouldn't be able to access, a lot of that. Because whenever you're using that, there is this burden of enforcing the authentication and authorization. REST does not do that. It is stateless. So it does not track inherently any of your authentication or authorization. You are responsible for building that functionality into the application yourself. Um, GraphQL was meant to kind of try and mitigate a lot of those issues with REST. Yes, if they set it up the way that Facebook recommends you set it up, or uh, it's good. Uh, very frequently, it's great. A lot of the tests that I've done for GraphQL have been super boring. Uh, we use GraphQL at Secure Ideas, so it's if you attempt it and try, it is really good. But I have noticed that when GraphQL goes wrong, it goes really wrong really fast. And unlike REST APIs where we have a lot of authentication or authorization issues, the things that I find most frequently with GraphQL is denial of service. Uh, so we have to be really careful with that because we don't do any testing that's destructive in nature. But GraphQL lets you do multiple queries as part of one request. So you can nest those for basically infinite amount of times and that will just eat up all of the processing memory. And Another thing that a lot of people don't seem to keep in mind is that the authentication process, if you use GraphQL for that, because GraphQL does this thing called batching, which is, again, it's that it lets you submit multiple requests or multiple queries as part of one request. It's really easy to enumerate usernames that way because while, oh, you can only make five requests a minute, each of those requests had 300 usernames in it. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Yes. It's a little bit of both. Um, so we get we get brought in depending on the client at all stages. We have some clients that one is there from the beginning. At every stage, we're doing some form of security check for them. Other ones, they have waited until the very end. And then they're like, okay, now you can come test it. So it, it very heavily depends on the, uh, the company and how their internal culture is around the security testing. Yes? So, are you, okay, I know we're probably close on time. We do have a booth. Yeah, we have a booth over in the exhibit hall. I would like to ask some more questions because depending on the type of API you're looking at could drastically influence the tools. Because there are some tooling out there like Voyager, I think it is for GraphQL, it's really great. Um, for REST APIs usually, I use Insomnia just for the building. Most of the time, I just need something to build that initial request, and most of the testing I'll do is through Burp. Uh, Burp is great, and then uh, Soap, Soap UI, you know, because if you hate yourself. <laughs> well, I'm glad my labs worked this time. 